Good morning. Glad you could be with me today as we're in the Word of God and the Unfolding the Word series. We're in the midst of the book of Daniel, and now we're in the second chapter of Daniel, examining yet another of the crises that Daniel faced in his life. And this was a crisis surrounding a dream that God had sent to Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the Babylonian Empire. I'm going to read out of chapter 2 today the verses that we've already begun to examine together. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And then the king commanded that all the magi, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. And so they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then the Chaldean said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell his servants the dream, and we'll show you the interpretation. But the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you don't make known to me both the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, now show me the dream and the interpretation. And then later on in verse 28, it says, Daniel speaking to the king says, There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king that what will happen in the latter days. All right, what are we talking about? Well, this new crisis facing Daniel and his friends is the crisis of a death sentence. They've been now confronted with the reality that they've just done this wonderful thing of getting passing the tests of chapter one. They're in positions now within the Magi order, uh, prepping for the future, and now they're told they're going to be killed. Now, in the backdrop to this, we looked a bit at Babylon itself and where Babylon came from, why it was such a central city. We looked a bit at Nebuchadnezzar, and I hope some of that background has been helpful for you. Now, today, let's turn attention to the dream itself and what God was doing in the midst of this dream that he was sending King Nebuchadnezzar. God had a purpose for the dream that he sent. <laughs> All right, he sent a prophetic dream to Nebuchadnezzar. It was a dream ultimately, as verse 28 shows us that I read to you, it was a dream ultimately about God's plan for history, making known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. What does that mean? Well, God is unfolding some of the pattern of history that is going to happen, not just could happen, but will happen. And he, by doing that, is showing to Nebuchadnezzar and to us, to all of the world, that it is, in fact, he who is in charge of human history. We might think, who is over history? How does history unfold? But he, our God, is the one who's in charge of human history. We learn in the midst of this chapter two unfolding that it is God who not only is in charge of history, it is God who is going to bring history to a climax and a close. The point of it being the dream of Daniel chapter two, which links to all of the rest of scripture, tells us that God, not man, determines the future that history is really his story. See how those two words link? History is really his story. He has determined what will happen in the unfolding of human history. The dream that was sent to Nebuchadnezzar that so troubled him was a dream about God's plan for history politically, uh, nationally, we could put it that way, until such time as his son, the Christ, the Messiah, returns to implement his kingdom, the Messianic kingdom. In this dream that we will be looking at and discussing together in the days ahead, he identifies the various Gentile kingdoms that will be dominating the Jews until the time of the return of the Lord. There are other kingdoms, of course, in the world, but these are the kingdoms that impinge on the people of God. Now, remember, Daniel was a Jew. 
Daniel was of those people who uh, saw themselves as God's chosen people, and they were a people under discipline by God. Their nation had ended, and they were now dominated by the, by the Babylonian Empire. And so God is saying, for the Jewish people, their destiny will be dominated by certain Gentile kingdoms. And there will be a sequence to these kingdoms. These kingdoms will come on the scene according to God's plan. They will stay on the scene until God's timetable for them is finished. And then no matter what plans they've made as kingdoms, they will be replaced by the next of the kingdoms in God's plan of history. All of it underscoring that God is the Lord of history. I hope you see God that way. The Bible goes to great lengths to reveal to us that, in fact, is who he is. He is the God of history. He is the Lord of history. And as I said earlier, history is his story. <laughs> He's the overseer. He is the implementer. And he is the closer of all of human history. I was thinking of Acts chapter 17. You remember Paul in Acts chapter 17 is speaking to the Athenians. He's on Mars Hill, the center for the intelligentsia, the philosophers of the day. And he speaks to them about Christ, and he speaks to them about the resurrection. And here's something he says to them in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live in all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. And he did this that they would seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, and yet he actually is not far from each one of us. Okay, who is the one who determines the allotted periods and the boundaries over history of all nations? God. Later on in chapter 2 of Daniel, in verse 21, we read this about God. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Who is it that is really in charge? And the answer is God. <laughs> and human history might seem to us to be a picture of humanity's control and direction, it is really a picture of the Lord of history and God's intentions. All of these things that God is unfolding in this dream and this sequencing of kingdom lead to the culmination of God's plan, which is to do away with Gentile kingdoms and replace it with the kingdom of his son, the Messiah. Now, God sent this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, who, as we've already seen, was the most powerful ruler of the ancient world. He was the one, I read this to you out of the fourth chapter of Daniel yesterday, he's the one who thought he was in charge of his life and of his kingdom and of history. He felt he was most in charge. And so God goes to the one who thinks they're most in charge and says, you're not in charge at all. I'm in charge, and I'll show it to you by my plan of history. We'll see more specifics about this plan of history in the days ahead. Now. Notice, once Nebuchadnezzar received this dream, he knew it wasn't like other dreams that he'd had. He was troubled. He was unsettled. The scripture here says that his mind was troubled, his sleep was disrupted. The picture that, that it gives us is that he couldn't rest until he had this thing interpreted because he knew it didn't originate in his mind. It came from somewhere and he had this understanding to some degree that it impacted on him and on his kingdom. He was a sharp guy, remember? <laughs> but he didn't know how it was to impact on his kingdom. All he knew was, I've got to find the answer to this dream. I've got to know why I got it. I've got to know what it means. And so what did he do? He turned to his advisors, the intelligentsia, that group who was in that privileged position to be influencers of the empire. And that, of course, was the Magi order. Yes, the same order out of which later on, at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus, uh, some of their order came to seek out the newborn king, as Matthew chapter 2 tells us about. Well, this was the Magi order. 
This was the order into which Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had just been promoted and put in positions. The Magi were the wisest of the land, the cream of the crop, the best trained. You couldn't buy better counselors. They were the fruit of the power and financial support of the empire. Daniel and his friends were in low levels of that group. At this point, they were just young, but that was the group. And so bringing that group to him, Nebuchadnezzar poses to them an impossible demand. And we'll look more at this tomorrow, but you remember as I read it to you today? I want you not only to interpret a dream, but I want you to actually tell me what the dream was without me telling you the dream. Join me tomorrow as we continue to look at this crisis of the dream. God bless.